Hello, we're back, baby. We're back, we're back. We're back, we're back. We're back. All right, jobs, part dose, roll theme. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of Pat Chats. Uh, job cat. It's the job cast part two. Uh, my zoom H uh, six, not a sponsor, but, uh, great product. Uh, my zoom H six, the batteries, uh, pooped out around, uh, college. We had made it through my job history through college. We spent 45 minutes and we made it through my job history up until college. I had just, uh, ended on the point that uh, I my favorite job, possibly my favorite job of all time, if I'm being honest, is uh, was being a janitor, being a janitor at my college. And it, I so much so, so much so that uh, my after I graduate, I got my degree from my prestigious Jesu- Jesuit university. And the summer after I graduated, I was like, what's the first thing I want to do with my degree? And I was like, let me be a janitor again. (laughs) Can I do one more summer on the janitor crew? That would be fantastic. And, uh, and I did. And honestly, it was great times. Uh, it was, it was great times. I regret nothing. And, um, and so, and then the plan was supposed to be after I, after I did that, uh, that I would move to Seattle, but I did not get my shit together. And so then I had to move home. Uh, and I think m- my parents were a bit shocked because I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to move to Seattle, blah, 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 blah. And then I think in the the janitor job ended and the sublease, which, which by the way, I was subleasing a, a room in the basement of this disgusting house for like $150 a month. Like it was fucking good deal. Uh, but real filth, like much more filth than the like 16 year old version of my bedroom. And, and, uh, at the end, at the end of the summer, I just moved into my friend's room, my friend, Brian, shout out, Brian, love you, Brian. And I moved into my friend's room and I just lived there. And then, and I was, I'm going to be honest. I was so comfortable there. I was very comfortable. And then I left for a weekend. I went to Seattle for a weekend to see some friends. And when I came back, Brian was like, yeah. So the rest of the guys in the house were kind of like, what's Patrick doing? Like, he's just living in your room. Like we're like, you know, we're chill, but like, I mean, it's been a month which is so fair. It's so more than fair. Uh, but I was devastated. I was like, ah. And so that week I was like, okay, I bought my plane ticket home. I called my parents. I was like, guys, I'm moving home. And, uh, so I moved home and I was like, okay, you know, this comedy dream, let me, let me pursue it. And so I signed up for a comedy college in San Francisco. And I remember, I was like, I need to get a job that I don't like. I need to get just like a boring day job so that I can pursue comedy. And my parents are like, maybe you could get a job that you still kind of like. And I was like, no, that's not how I do it. That's not how the art form is pursued. Uh, And so I went to uh, the bank, Wells Fargo, where I still bank. And I was... I was doing something. I was like getting, I think I was getting a credit card or, 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 or something along those lines. I, I don't know. I was doing some banking. I was talking to a banker and I was telling him like, ah, I need a job. And he was like, well, you, Wells Fargo is always hiring. You should think about applying for, for working here. And so that's what I did. I was like, ah, oh, fuck it. I could work at a bank. And so then I got a job as a bank teller at Wells Fargo. And it's funny because like now when I tell people, like I look, now I look like this, you know, Um, and so when I tell people I worked at a bank, like I get a reaction where they're like, uh, but net, but the, but like at the time I totally looked like someone who could work at a bank. And also when you tell people like, oh, I worked at Wells Fargo, I think they don't understand what it means to be a bank teller because being a bank teller 
is the McDonald's of banking. You know, it's like it is the lowest rung. You're essentially like a customer service person. It's you're 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 filling. I mean, you you're handling a lot of money and stuff, but it is it is uh, not like a prestigious job. It take there is no you don't have like I think you basically have to graduate high school to get that job, and maybe not even that. Like it's not. Uh, I was not wowed by the the people around me. I think I was one of the only people who had graduated college in our group of like banking tellers. Um, and so I got this job a, as a bank teller at, at Wells Fargo in Mill Valley. And uh, I mean, it was a good job and it was, it was, I would have written down here is it was toxic, but fun. It was toxic, but fun. Like there was a, very kid vibe there was uh this this girl amanda who had a boyfriend who i was like low-key in love with she was just you know we we had such a fun dynamic uh and and she really made that job for me i will say um and uh and then it got later in life it got weird between us and now we don't speak uh sorry and um and so uh there was Amanda. Then there was like Amanda, the manager who was cool. She was like, she had real like bad bitch energy, you know, like she had like the long nails. She was super funny. Um, but she also would like, she could, you like, she had mastered. She was a fucking pro at the art of doing customer, like being a bitch in customer service, you know, like being nice, but like giving no ground because, Working at a bank, and I worked at a bank in an area where people were super wealthy. Like it was one, like one of the wealthiest areas, probably in the country. Um, George Bush talked about uh, Mill Valley kind of as like this hot tub place. You know, everybody's rich, and I would see crazy people. You'd see people coming in there who had five hundred thousand dollars in their checking account. You know, like you saw, like you saw some uh, insane wealth and that was a fun thing about being a bank teller is like you had this whole computer system and so you could just creep on people's financials. Like someone would come in and like, and, and, and you know, you'd have some sort of type of interaction and if, if it made you curious, you could just be like, doop, 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 and like, you know, be like, oh, you have this mortgage and you have this thing. And you were technically doing your job because you were investing, investigating the account for like sales opportunities. Um, and uh, so there was Amanda there was who was who was sleeping with at the time, the lead teller, the lead bank teller who I can't remember his name, but he was a cool dude. Me and him were like cool and he was into rap and I was into rap and like it was it was cool, you know, Um and, and then there was Craig. Oh my God. I loved Craig. Craig was like 65 gay guy, uh, who did like musical theater and was like a big theater guy. His son like did makeup on Broadway and like toured with Lady Gaga. And Craig was like a darling. Craig, Craig was someone he was, and he was funny because he would, he would be bitchy and he would be moody sometimes, but he was also like the adult of the group. And it must have, in hindsight, it's like all of us were like kids and there was all this like dumb bullshit dynamic and whatnot. And, uh, and he, and he must have sometimes been like, oh my God, these fucking kids. But like we went, we like went and hung out at Craig's house a few times when we like, we, we all like went out drinking together and stuff. And I just, he was so funny and he had these great stories about like, being gay in the seventies in Oregon and like going down to the docks to find some sailor to blow. And like, I mean, uh, Craig was, Craig was, I, yeah, now I'm talking about it. It's like, there were so many good characters. It was, it was brutal. And then I, it was fun. It was brutal because they had these sales marks. And as a bank teller, anytime someone came in, they would give you little things like, Hey, make, try to get this guy to open another bank account or try to get them to get a credit card or, and, and you had to hit a certain number of sales every day. And, uh, and they would put a lot of pressure on you on that. And if you hit a certain number, you got like cap bonuses on your paycheck. And if you didn't get a certain number, you could get fired. And that was like really one of the things that made the job awful. And on top of all of that, you're handling thousands and thousands of dollars in cash every day coming in and coming out. And, uh, and if you, if your cash drawer doesn't balance, uh, you could lose your job from that too. And I had one time, you know, I was, I lost somehow like $400, uh, 
which didn't get me fired, which is wild, right? Uh, I think you could technically, if they liked you, you could lose up to $1,000 without it being like an automatic firing. I mean, one time, one time. And uh, and so, so that was crazy. You're handling this cash. You learn how to do the cash. And then the other thing is like people are coming in trying to do sometimes semi-sketchy stuff. You know, they have a check. They want to cash the check. And they don't have enough money in their bank account to cover the, the, the cash check if the check bounces. And so then you have to tell them, no, sorry, we can't cash the check. And then they throw a hissy fit, a whole thing. Uh, so those were like the stressful parts. And then also rich people, just rich people dealing. You're dealing with people's money. You're denying people their own money. And then I remember also one time uh, the guy ordering the cash for the bank, we didn't get enough hundreds in. And it was the holiday season and everybody wanted to come in and get $100 bills to like give out as gifts and shit. Because again, rich people place. And we didn't have enough hundreds, so I could only give out like one or two hundred dollar bills per customer, and people were pissed. I was like, I could give you fifties, I could give you twenty. You know, we have the money, but we just don't have the hundred dollar bills. And that was like, you know, people would yell at you. I mean, it was, it was, it was a wild, wild dynamic. Um, and then yeah, there's this interpersonal drama of like people are hooking up. There's and then there's the bankers, which is like they're kind of a tier higher than us. Um, this there was this uh, Filipino woman Marissa who would come and just give us crystals all the time, and uh, she would she was killing it as a banker. She was just like she was racking it in. She was killing it as a banker, doing her thing, and she was so sweet. She was really te would teach te la la la. I can't speak hour two. She would treat the bank tellers with like good treatment, you know, and. Uh, but then there was this other guy, Alario, who was like, he was, there was like a banker and then like a junior bank. He was like a j junior banker and he thought he was the shit and he would really like, he used to be a bank teller and he would really like kind of talk down to the tellers and be really rude. And I remember one time he tried to let someone in after the bank had closed and we had already cashed out our cash drawers. Like we were, we were doing our totals at the end of the day and I'm like, I can't reopen it. And then, you know, so he had told the customer that he could come in and do a transaction. And then the guy came in and I kind of like stood up for us and I was like, we're not doing it. And when the guy left, he was like really getting in my face. And uh, I'm such a punk. I was such a punk. I was a 22 year old kid. This guy, Latino guy, me, you know, 22 white kid, uh, graduate college. In, in hindsight, I was I was being a punk, but he was also being an idiot. And he was a, he was an asshole. Uh, but like after that interaction, I was like, dude, we already cashed out. Like he was like getting in my face being like, you got to do this. Like you, why didn't you do this? Like, you're making us look bad. I'm going to tell the manager. And I was like, tell the manager, like we had already cashed out our cash drawers. And you know, we told, I told you that you, you're the one who decided to let him in anyways. Cause you wanted to look like the cool guy who could get a favor in. And, and he was like, yeah, yeah, you're smiling now, but you won't be smiling when I give you fucking stitches. And, uh, so he, like, he was threatening to, to beat me up and, and I laughed in his face, <laughs> such a fucking rich kid punk move, but I laughed in his face and I was like, did you just threaten me at work in front of all of our coworkers? Did you just threaten me with physical violence at work in front of all of our coworkers? And then he like got so red and he like, he knew he had stepped in it, you know, cause he was trying to be like fucking, you know you know, whatever with me. And I was like, mm, I got some white privilege here that I'm going to fucking shower on you. And, uh, so yeah, that was a Lario. So that was, the, there was like the bank, those were the bankers, which was like another level and, uh, interesting job, wild job. What else did I want to say about that? Oh, um, so it was in this like very rich affluent town and I really, you know, I, I liked the people I worked with. If it weren't for the sales thing, I think I would have liked the job more, um, the customers, some of them were sweet, but a lot of them were brrr, terrible, like the worst. It, they're why people hate the rich, you know, like you get it, someone coming in and you're they're like screaming at me about the fact that the ATM just charged them a dollar for their bank statement, which, you know, to be fair, that's like bullshit. But, you know, whatever. And you're like, I'm so sorry. Let me just pull up your account. And then you pull up their account and you're like, you have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in checking, like I'm making $11 an hour and I'm just going to give you the dollar back because it's less work than, you know, trying to refund you this dot. Like, but I mean, then maybe that's how they got rich. Maybe. Uh, so I hated the customer. So, and at this time I also thought I was so cool. I was into EDM. I loved EDM 
And I thought that like that made me super edgy and cool and I loved it. And like and so I would drive into fucking sleepy little Mill Valley at eight in the morning, windows down, just blasting my EDM super loud. Kind of like that was my that was my little way. That was my little way to just be like, fuck you, fuck you guys, fuck you guys. So that was my little way of saying fuck you to the rich people in Mill Valley, blasting my EDM. And one other thing I thought that was funny to mention about the well, my time at Wells Fargo. Uh, so when I came home uh, and got my job as a bank teller at Wells Fargo, <laughs> my mom was like, and, and then I had also started comedy college uh, in San Francisco, which is it's a whole other thing for a whole other podcast. But uh, she was like, I'm kind of embarrassed. Like people, you're back now. And people are like, oh, what's Patrick up to? He's back. He's done with college. And she's like, it's kind of embarrassing to say that you work at Wells Fargo. Like it's embarrassing to say you work at a bank. Can I tell them that you're going to comedy college instead? Which is such an encapsulation of like the kind of hippie artist liberal shit like childhood I had is it's like my parents were embarrassed. I worked at a bank and they're like, we'd rather tell people that you're pursuing a dream of stand up comedy. We'd rather tell them that you're going to a comedy college in San Francisco than tell them you're a bank teller at Wells Fargo, <laughs> which is hilarious. I think I think that's pretty funny. I think it's pretty funny. Uh, so, yeah, Wells Fargo, that was a that was a job. And then I was I was like I'm, I wanted to move to Seattle and so I was like I'm good I, I transferred with Wells Fargo to a bank branch in Seattle and then I, I had been applying for jobs in Seattle didn't hear anything so I'm like I'll chance transfer with Wells Fargo and then after I had already transferred but before I had moved I finally I randomly got a call from this company called Cox Reps which was under the the Cox Cable Company umbrella and uh that was my first and last first and last proper office job like that was the the only time i really had like a proper worked in a cubicle monday through friday nine to five matching retirement savings health insurance like real office job uh cox reps And when they hired me, they were like, hey, if we hire you, this job takes a long time to, to learn. So if, you, if we hire you, we're asking that you commit to two years. And I was like, sure, no problem. And I showed up, and within the first month, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, this is going to be a long 23 more months. A long 23 more months. And the job was basically... It was a job I didn't under know existed, and uh, the fun thing about the job is I hated it. It it it, it gave me a lot of uh, gray hair. It stressed me out. I hated it. And at the end of the day, I could go home and think, well, I made the world a worse place uh, because the job basically our job was we would be an intermediary uh, between advertising agencies and local television news stations, and so advertising agencies would work with us. And we would uh, take their ad packages, you know, for, say, um, I, I'm trying to think of a, a good example. But I don't, one of the ones that I remember, because it was one of the worst ones, was these, like, predatory colleges, you know, these, these, coll these trade school colleges that were, like, predatory. And so an advertising agency representing them would work with us, and then we would disperse their ads to like a bunch of TV, local TV stations in like Alabama and Missouri and Kansas or wherever, you know? And what happens in local TV news is there'll be breaking news or a sports game will go long or whatever. And so the ad space that they bought, say they bought a 30 second ad during Monday night football, or maybe they bought a 15 second ad during uh, Jerry Springer at 3 p.m. or whatever, you know? Uh, so maybe that, that ad doesn't get aired because of breaking news or something scheduling happen happening. And so then our job would be to work with the local TV station and the advertising agency as a middleman to try to help negotiate how that ad would then be aired. So as to make up for the original thing, the advert the advertising agency had bought. Um, I know it sounds so boring and it was so boring um and it was just everybody like 
you annoying the TV station being like, how are we going to make this up? That's not a good enough offer. You need to do better. And then the advertising agency being like, what the TV station offered is not good enough. What are you doing? And then you're just in the middle, you know, having people be dicks to you and being dicks to people and, uh, and all to make the world a worse place by selling more TV ad space to a, a, a lot of companies that I'm going to be honest were like not great. Um, and the boss who I, I, I will say, I, she was nice, she was sweet, but she would yell. She would be, Patrick! Get in here, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the, the people who worked it, they were sweet, you know, they were nice, but it was, it was rough sometimes. And I was not great at the job. And I will say also, I moved up to Seattle to be with my friends and to party. And I would come in to work. Like I was so unprofessional at that job. You know, um, I would come in super late. Like, first of all, I will say for my boss, I will give her credit, but the screaming part was, was shit. But, um, I worked out with her at the beginning. I was like, is it okay if I sometimes come in a little late if I stay later? And she would come in early and leave early. So she was like, yeah, it's fine. And so some, we, I think we were supposed to be there 8.30 to 5.30 or something. And so sometimes I would roll in at like 9. On really bad days, I would roll in at like 9.30. And I mean, I would stay until 7.30 or whatever. But a lot of the, the thing is like TV stations, everybody there would go home at 5. So as soon as five hit there wasn't a lot of more work that you could do especially because we worked with tv stations in central time zone each yeah i'm getting into too many details but so uh it, staying late it really worked for me but i would come in super hungover um like viciously hungover i would like uh, you know also sometimes it would get slow and it was the type of job where it's like you weren't allowed to do nothing and you knew if you asked for another job like they would give it to you and and, and at a certain point like i like reorganized their entire filing system i did a bunch of like dumb easy jobs i became the office supply ordering manager and was a little low-key criminal i was just ordering myself office supplies and taking them home sorry uh sorry cox um and uh and to be fair, though, they were paying us shit. I was making $15 an hour, and uh, for the amount of stress and work, like, that job, like, it was bullshit. And uh, so so I would come in late, viciously hungover, and they were always, like, they never, she never said anything to me. So, I mean, it was never to a point where they had to address it, but I, I know because they used to gossip about one of the other uh, executive assistants. Uh, that was my position. I was an executive assistant. Uh, about one of the other executive assistants that used to work there. They used to gossip and be like, oh, the first year you worked here, he would come in smelling like booze and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, they're definitely saying the same thing about me. I wonder what they say about me now, honestly. Um, and so, yeah, so that was a that was my first, I worked in a cubicle. I would, I would watch The Daily Show at work every day. And, uh, I even, sometimes I would be honest, like there was this little park down the street I would go down there and I would like have a little toke and then come back. I, I don't, I would never do that now because I was so anxious that they would know that I was high the whole time. It was like not enjoyable. I was just doing it because I wanted to be able to say I was getting high at lunch, you know, like I was just doing it. It was like, I was like, look at me being someone who gets high at lunch. And it's like, I was literally just doing it for that. And then I would just be sitting there super anxious. And, um, yeah, so that was a, that was a hard job. It was a, it was a rough job, but it got me to Seattle. It was an office job. I had to wear, you know, dress shirt, dress shoes. I didn't have to wear a tie like I did at the bank, which was good. And, um, and so, yeah, that was my, that was my thing. And, uh, and then that job prompted me to be like, okay, what the fuck am I doing? Like I, after the two years I, now I was, I was like, I had just turned 25. I'm, I'm several years out of college. I've given, you know, the comedy thing is like long gone. I let, when I left San Francisco, I was kind of like, Oh, I'm going to keep pursuing comedy in Seattle. And then I got to Seattle and I was like, Oh, I have friends and there's like a whole city to go to here and we go to raves. So I don't really have time for this. Um, and so I just like left that behind and I was just working. Then, then I was just working a shitty job I didn't like and had no interest in like pursuing further just for no reason, not because I was pursuing comp, like just for no reason at all. And, uh, and so that was terrible. And so then I was like, I gotta, I gotta do something. And so my last like six months at the job, I started saving up money and I was like, I want to do this road trip. I want to live out of my car 
by choice privilege and uh, go to all the national parks. I want to go camping. I want to like, cause this is my whole personality is like, I get into something like I went backpacking like twice. And then I was like, I should quit my job and live out of my car and just go backpacking everywhere. And so, uh, so I, 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 after Cox, I, I, I took this, uh, this time and I was like, the thing I kept saying to people too, is it's like, you know, I just want to take this time to, you know, kind of find myself and like figure out what do I really want to do? Like, you know, with the time off, what I want to figure out is like, where do I, where do I really want to go in my life? Like, what is the direction I really want to take? And that is the eight, you know, I feel like after college, like I knew people who were, they, they get some shit job that they start to do. And then around that age is the age where they're like, I should go to back to school and become a nurse, or I, I should go back to school and become a lawyer. I should, uh, I should do this thing. I should do that. Like that's, that's the thing. And what I discovered at the end of my six months living out of my car, doing the road trip thing, uh, was that I, what I really, really liked the, the, the thing that, you know, made the most sense to me was not working. I was like, I found myself and myself likes not working. That's what I like is just not working. That's what's for me. You know, some people have dream jobs and my dream job is just to not have a job. That's my dream. And um, that was the conclusion I, I came to. And so at the end of that road trip, I was like out of money. And so once again, I was like, privilege uh I was like guys to my parents like I think I kind of need to move home I don't have any money left and I don't know what to do and so I ended up back at my parents house I'm 25 now living at home with my parents I've left my office job uh, by all apparent markers my life is kind of not going in a good direction uh, but I was actually very happy. I was like, this is great. I did kind of find myself a little bit on that trip. I'll say, I don't want to be too hippy dippy. Okay. That was, well, maybe that was racist. I meant it in a white hippie way. Um, uh, I, I, but I was, I was happy. And so I'm at home and I'm like, what am I going to do? What, what I learned really on that trip was like, I want to travel more. And so I was like, I need to make some more money. What am I going to do while I'm living at home? And, uh, there was this health food store and there had been a health food store near my house that I lived in Seattle. And it always seemed like cool people worked there, you know, like cool, like hippie people. And I was like, that's what I want to be. That's who I want to be. I should get a job at the health food store. And so I applied for a job at the good earth, which, um, besides janitoring, I will say one of the uh, best jobs I've ever had. Um, really just fucking phenomenal. Shout out Good Earth Natural Foods, Fairfax, California, Mill Valley, California uh, locations. Um, check it out. So, uh, so I move home and I'm, I, and, and it's a, it is like the real, literally they were one of the first organic and natural food stores in the country. They opened in the 60s and it's this small independently owned grocery store that was very like heavily, um, heavily into like local source, local shit. And to be honest, like when people go to that grocery store, like when I took Anya there, I mean, first of all, she was so appalled by the prices. I mean, it is wildly expensive wildly expensive to shop there but the selection and quality that they get is phenomenal and they have you know a full working cafe full working kitchen pizza asian food mexican food deli um they amazing meat and seafood department uh the produce department is crazy and I worked in something called the bulk foods department, uh, which if you are not familiar with uh, organic and natural food stores or health food stores, although they always push back, we're like, we're not a health food store. We sell cookies and we sell unhealthy stuff. We're an organic and natural food store. Uh, but bulk food is basically they have things like grains, flour, salt, um, almonds, cashews, you know, snacks, basically anything that you would buy that would normally come in a big plastic bag or something like that. And we buy it in bulk. And then we have these bins where you can self-serve however much you want. You weigh it out yourself. 
and uh, pay for it. And that way you can bring your own reusable container. Also, it's a little bit cheaper because since we can buy it in bulk, we can pass the savings down to you. Clearly, I'm like passionate about it. I had a good time at Good Earth. Um, I feel like we're getting into like less and less entertaining with this uh, jobs cast. I think part one was a hotter cast. Part one, if you haven't seen part one, go back and check part the early years of jobs. Much more, much more entertaining. So I, uh, I get the job at Good Earth, small independent grocery store, and I was already into the whole organic food thing, but it really made me believe in it. Um, it also really, I have to say, you know, Republicans always go on about like small businesses, small business, and I was always like, well, whatever, I don't give a shit about small businesses. And that really made me believe in the power of small business. It's like, it was so nice to work for a company where it's like, I know the owner, I know the management. And if I have an idea about how we could make something better, I can just say it to them and we might even implement it. And we actually did, you know, and having that kind of agency at your job was so rewarding. And I love, like, I really, I loved working at the health food store like that. You know, I joke about the, the janitor job being one of my favorite jobs, but working at the health food store was you know, really one of my favorite jobs that I had had. Uh, you're on your feet all day. You're moving. You're doing stuff physical. The people who worked at the health store, health food store were super cool. Very, uh, like, so much diversity, uh, economic diversity, diversity of perspective, racial diversity, uh, uh, gender diversity, like, everything. Like, age diversity, you know, like there's this lady, Rua, uh, Ru, who worked in the supplements department, who was like the sweetest lady. She was like 80 or 75 or something. I mean, she was old, like old. And she was the sweetest lady. I loved her. We always had like nice conversations. She was a poet. There was just like so many interesting, different types of people uh, who had had interesting lives. I, I always have a dream that I'm like, if I ever write like a TV series, It'll be like the, 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 the backdrop will be an organic and natural food store because there's so many sorts of like interesting characters. They also like they would hire people who were, you know, like recent uh, recently released from jail to work on the janitorial. Like they had very progressive hiring th uh, ch choices. And um, I really can't say enough good things about it. Um, and, and, and honestly, I think. If there had been a better economic opportunity at that store, I probably would have settled down there because moving back to my hometown, it's like it's an amazing hometown. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. I love the people I worked with. I liked the work I was doing. The best part was even if I had a bad day at the end of the day, I thought to myself, I did something good. You know, I helped people have access to good, healthy foods um, and 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 honestly, you know, this pre-pandemic, before we started recognizing grocery store workers as essential workers and heroes, I kind of felt like I was like, this is an important job. Like tell, selling TV ad space is not, that's not important. Like no, it doesn't, the world doesn't need that. Um, but unfortunately, working at a grocery store, uh, even one, and I became a man, quickly became a manager there. Uh, uh, I became a buyer and then I became a manager. And the, unfortunately, the thing is working at a grocery store, even one with good, you know, better wages than most. And I was making good money at the end. I was making 20 something dollars an hour. You're not like, especially for the cost of living in the Bay Area. It's just not feasible. It's not a career. You know, it's not it's just not a it's not a thing. And I if it if it if I could have made. Forty thousand, forty, fifty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars a year at that grocery store. I might have stayed there. I might have never ended up in Germany. I might have never continued to uh, pursue the dream of of comedy that I'm pursuing now. Comedy. Um, so uh, this is getting. I this. I'm losing steam. I should. All right, we gotta we gotta move through this. What's funny about the Good Earth? What do, uh, the cast of characters, the customers are wild. That is part of what would make my my little dream of of writing a television show about the the cast of characters working at a health food store so good. Is the customers are like you get some wild crystal fairy, you know, uh, like. They'll be like, do you know, like, was the water used to make these grains, like, was that, like, blessed with crystals? Or um, 
and and then they'd be like and and then also like you know the wokest people but then coming in and saying like super racist shit like they're like ah you only have the chinese pumpkin seeds and you know chinese pumpkin seeds are they use so many chemicals you know it's just disgusting over there like they have no standards it's garbage like i know you say it's certified organic and whatnot but like I, we i would never eat a chinese pumpkin seed i need the 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 17 a pound uh pumpkin seeds grown in oregon okay that's what i need like it's just wild people and again it's a rich area so like rich people doing customer service for rich people is right back to wells fargo where customer service for rich people is uh it's a nightmare rich people are entitled uh and people would be the worst sometimes you know and and if you were out of something they were pissed at you they you know they had real attitudes and 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 it got worse over the time i was working there when i first started there people would there was a lot more uh gratitude and it was a lot more um hippies and stuff who were shopping there and then it became more and more like kind of yuppie rich people whatever uh i mean there was always that there but it, it got worse in my opinion and uh but yeah you had some really interesting people and one of the things is like the owners were like huge hippies so they were like you're allowed to come into the store barefoot like that's totally fine like we support barefootness so people would come in barefoot like you would see some very like real interesting characters interesting like good like a great portfolio of hippies like all sorts of different types of hippies different varietals and 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 everything um heirloom hippie like i mean the whole thing like it just a great great uh portfolio of hippies as i said it's just just wild and uh so that was cool i loved i loved good earth um and then i got my final job uh that i have now being a fisherman fishing commercial salmon fishing in alaska which i've made multiple podcasts about and you can go watch those. Uh, maybe I'll link to them if I remember. I don't know. Um, but I think the one thing I'll note, note is like, so I I worked at the health food store. I saved up some money. And then I went to South America, and, which is where I met Anya. And, and I was traveling there for like a year. And then I came back so broke. Like the end, the thing is I was supposed to go home in the beginning of July. And then I met Anya. And I was just like, well, fuck it. Like, this is going to be my wife. <laughs> now I wasn't saying that, but I was just like, this is like, this is someone I like, I finally met someone I really like and I want to pursue this. And so I skipped my flight home and I was, I was out of money. And I like, I mean, I still had a little bit of money. And so just everything that I could, I charged it to my credit card. And then I used the small amount of money that I had left to just make the minimum payments on the credit card. And I remember when I finally made it home at like the end of September. So I made it like three more months without uh, after I was supposed to go home. And I had so I owed so much money on my credit card. And I remember I hadn't even made it home yet. I flew home through Denver and I had to call my mom, uh, which was a real low moment, and ask her if I could borrow one hundred and fifty dollars because that's the minimum payment my credit card had gotten up to. And I didn't have $150 to spend on that thing. So I came back and uh, immediately got a bat job back at the, the health food store. Shout out Good Earth. Uh, that was the ultimate like safety net of my 20s was I was lucky enough to have parents that I had a great relationship with who would welcome me home. And then I just had a place that would give me a job anytime I came back. Like I could always pick up shifts. I could always work. And so I could take myself down to broke and then come back, make some money, go again. And, but that first time that I came back, the first weekend I was home, uh, I went to my friend's wedding. And at my friend's wedding, his mom, uh, my friend's mom, her brother, her brother had remarried. And her brother's new wife, her, uh, her son was at the wedding. And I was going to smoke a joint. And I was like, hey, man, you want to come smoke a joint? And we started uh, talking about, you know, fucking life. And he started telling me about commercial fishing. And he was like, you can make a bunch of money and then you don't have to work the rest of the year. And I was like, well, that's funny because my dream job is not working. So that seems like something that could really work out for me. And so I asked for his email and we exchanged contact information. and He helped me kind of find a job. 
And now the last five years I've done commercial salmon fishing, which has been the closest thing to my dream job that I found out when I was 25 that I've ever had, which is um, not working. Not working. So, uh, and that's that's the job history. That's the job history. And the, the note I wanted to end on is, uh, you know, what is the dream job now? What is the dream now? And I will say, I mean, I guess technically I could say it's kind of a job now is I have, I've made money doing comedy. And every time I do it, it feels like such a fucking scam. I'm like, you are going to give me money for what I did for just doing this thing that I think is so fun. And like, I get so much out of it. Like it's why it feels like I should have to pay people. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, comedians are like, that's so like, uh, you know, we have to value our art. We have to value our work. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know, but it feels like a scam. It feels like a big time scam. Um, and so I guess obviously the dream job is like to do this. Like if, if someone would want to pay me to do this, which by the way, go fund me. I'm accepting donations, Patreon. I don't know, whatever. Uh, if, if the, if the word could get, could get out on this podcast and people could start being like, I would love to pay you for this thing that you're doing. That would be amazing. Uh, but yeah, the dream is obviously to, to do this, to do comedy, to make money doing that. Um, which would, I mean, that's the greatest scam of all. And that's the thing I will say to go back full circle. Oh, I, the other full circle thing is I thought it was funny. I started in manual labor and now I'm back in manual labor. I'm doing commercial salmon. If you remember, I did this whole thing. I was like, it's going to come full circle. And it did. I started doing yard work for my parents and I'm a commercial fisherman. Like it's just manual labor, but I'm also 32 now. And I'm like, my body is starting to go and uh, I got to get it together. So so I would really like to stop fishing. So it'd be great if I could make some money do, doing comedy. But the thing is, I was going to say, the thing that I love about doing the comedy and the podcasting is it's like, I'm just doing this, you know, like I'm working at it and I like, I like doing the work. Like even the stuff that's not the perform, like, like the writing, recording this, editing these, put, you know, making something. I fucking love doing the work. And that's what I was looking for when I was 25. I was like, what is the thing that I doesn't feel like doing work. I mean, it still feels like work, but it doesn't feel like a job um, because it's not, it's a hobby. <laughs> so that's the thing. That's my, that's the job cast. Um, I'll just take us through. We started in manual labor, manual labor, man. Well, it, what? Um, manual labor, yard work jobs. Uh, then I became a sports announcer at my high school. I did the PA announcing at my high school, PA announcing at my high school. Then uh, I became a bagger at Andronico's, uh, bagged groceries. Uh, then I got a job at a running shoe store, a high-end running shoe store, Fleet Feet, Marin Running, County, Marin running Company, shout out. Uh, then I got a series of uh, internships at some television stations, CSN Bay Area, uh, the local TV news station in Spokane. Uh, I had those internships. Then I became a janitor. At my school, I became a janitor at my college, and that was a great time. Loved being a janitor. Uh, then I became a bank teller at Wells Fargo. I was a bank teller at Wells Fargo. What a nightmare. Uh, then my first, last, uh, only office job, uh, I worked for Cox Reps under the Cox Cable Company umbrella, selling TV advertising space. Whoo! Uh, then I left that job and uh, started, came back to the grocery store thing, started working at uh, Good Earth, the, the original Whole Foods, worked at the grocery store for a while. Uh, then I became a commercial salmon fisherman in Alaska, and now I'm trying to become a comedian. And that's it. That's the job cast. We did it. Job cast. The first part was much better than the second part. I'm so sorry. Uh, but hey, we got some content that we're filling up. While I'm gone this summer, we're filling the content. We're filling the content. Fill it. Uh, okay, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, please rate and review. Share it with a friend. I mean, come on. I'm trying to make this dream job a reality. So uh, let's get the name of this podcast out there. And I honestly do believe it's getting better. I mean, this episode wasn't great, but the last one was interesting. I think the last one was interesting. 
If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Please like the video. It takes nothing from you. Just like the video. If you haven't subscribed, what the fuck are you doing? Subscribe to the video. Share this podcast with a friend. Uh, get the word out. It's been Pat Chats. I've been Patrick. This has been the Jobcast. Get a job. Don't get a job. I don't care. My dream job is not working, but now it's doing comedy. Good night. Yeah.